All right, how you guys doing? Uh, that sounds kind of weak. Let's. Uh, how you doing? Great. Yeah, good to see you. Well, that's right. We get to start off tonight's exciting study with a special, once again, public service announcement from who? That's right, the Kingpins of Las Vegas. Give it up for the Mark and Doug Show. You're just trotting right on up here. There you go. That's a little microphone humor. Take it away. This is not. <laughs> uh, anyway. Uh, again, just a reminder, uh, every Monday for the next 12 weeks, well, not 12 weeks, we already had two weeks done, is the uh, Bowling League at Samstown at 6.30. Um, we meet up there at the Bowling Alley. It's $10 uh, to come join us. Uh, shoes are included. Anybody's welcome. We don't test skills. We just go there and have fun and have a great, great uh, fellowship. Everybody did so well. What a great turnout. Everybody was bowling like, what, three digits? Yeah. Yeah. I bowled a perfect six. So <laughs> anyway, <laughs> anyway, um, again, Monday, we're going to be meeting there. So come join us. It'll be wonderful. Lots of fun. Anything to add? You did great. What? You did great. Yeah. Give it up for the Mark and Doug show live from Vegas. That's right. Well, hey, uh, we are going to get started with our study. We got a uh, video based study. Of course, we're dealing with Halloween. And I thought, man, I was getting ready to do the, uh, continue on with our charismatic chaos. Lord willing, we'll do that next week. But I thought, man, it's the day before Halloween. Let's just get a refresher. What's going on with this thing? And where is it coming from? And what should we be doing about it? So, but let's begin in prayer. Father, thank you so much for our study tonight. And God, as we uh, take a look at your word, Old and New Testament, uh, help us to live lives that are pleasing to you. And to be those lights in the midst of the darkness, not grabbing hold of the darkness. And uh, we just pray that... Uh, Lord, you willing for still alive and still here uh, tomorrow during this time uh, called Halloween. Uh, as we're about to see, there's so much uh, wickedness that really does take place. I don't think people realize. God, use us uh, to shine your light in the midst of such great evil. And um, help us, God, to make a difference. Hmm especially with what's, what's really going on. Uh, may we not get apathetic. Uh, may we not get indifferent. But may we realize that there is evil afoot. And we have the answer through you, Jesus, to set people free, including people who are involved in the deepest of the darkness. You could still set them free. You do it all the time. So please bless our study tonight. We ask all this in your wonderful name, in Jesus' name, and all God's people said, amen. Hey, uh, Deuteronomy chapter 18 is our first text. Let's get uh, started. What does God say about uh, being involved in things with witchcraft and sorcery and the things that are going on, certainly, unfortunately, at Halloween, not just uh, being portrayed with costumes and uh, decorations in the yard and all that stuff, uh, and even just the traditional background of all. But there's actual witchcraft and sorcery and things of that nature going on during this time as well. So what does God have to say about that? Old Testament, Deuteronomy chapter 18, verse 9. When you get there, say moo. Moo, got a couple cows out there, praise God. Okay, and I'll give you a little bit more time. Deuteronomy and uh, 18, verse 9. And my Bible says, it has a little header here. This is kind of a clue what you're going to read. Uh, detestable practices. How many of you guys would say that some of you probably should shy away from? Yeah, yeah I think it's pretty plain. But here's, here's what's detestable to God. And if there's anybody you want to please it too, it's God. Hello. Right? Here's what he says. When you enter the land, the Lord your God has given you. Do not learn to imitate. What, what, what's that mean? Do not learn to imitate. Now, what does that imply right there? Don't take on their characteristics, don't act like them, don't speak like them, don't live like them, don't behave like them, imitate. You know, it's kind of like commitment. You ever, like, you know, don't do that. Okay, then he gives you the, here's the things you don't want to do. You do not want to imitate any of this stuff, right? The detestable ways of the nations there. Let no one be found among you who sacrifices his son or daughter in the fire. Now stop right there. What was that practice? We dealt with that for eight weeks in our study on abortion, the mass murder of children. What he's talking about is the worship of the false god demon, Molech. And that's what the people would do is they believe that they would get a personal gain. They would get better crops. They'd get favor, okay, if they took their child 
and they threw it in the hot burning arms of an idol that was uh, fire inside of it, so it got brazen red hot in the arms of this idol called Molech. And so they would throw the babies alive in there to uh, gain a uh, personal gain. What does that sound like today? Abortion, that's what we dealt with before. But that's what he says, don't let no one be found among you who does that. That's detestable. Don't you dare imitate that, right? Who sacrifices his son or daughter in the fire. We would use the vernacular uh, who murders them. The abortion, I think it's a very good vernacular, unfortunately. Uh, who also practices what? <coughs> Divination or sorcery. Interprets omens. Uh, engages in what? witchcraft or cast spells or who is a medium or a spiritist or who consults with the dead boy that sounds like most shows on tv today doesn't it and what's got to say about that don't imitate that don't you dare go no no and again why because they're detestable notice the word that's used there detestable now if i sat something before you and i said hey guys i want you to partake of something and uh, before I show it to you, be encouraged. What I'm about to give to you is absolutely, utterly detestable. Dig in. You got that right, Ruth. You know it's chicken, <laughs> right? But what would you do? I mean, seriously, if I lay and I said, it was just, hey, here's, something, here's something detestable. Dive in. Whoa, what would you say? No, I, I already ate. Right? You know, run, right? But that's what God's saying. This is detestable stuff. Right? Don't even, don't even go down that route. Okay? And again, that includes the stuff that on TV. How many of those shows are on TV? Not just with witchcraft and sorcery and movies and things of that nature, but still what blows me away is all this, uh, 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 the, the ghost uh, things and people going, we're going to go ghost hunting and ghost hunters and all that. What are you, that's consulting with the dead. And the Bible's very clear. When somebody dies, you go straight to heaven if you're a Christian or you go, if you're not a Christian, you go where? Straight to hell. There is no in-between. You ain't passing back forth. If you see an apparition, if it claims to be Abraham Lincoln or Aunt Vera, guess what? It's a demon. The Bible calls it a familiar spirit. Don't do it. I don't care what you think. I don't care how many. They sounded just like my dad. It's a deception. Don't do that. Okay? Then he goes on. He says, anyone who does these things is what? Detestable to the Lord. How many guys, that's, that's your goal in life. You got up today, says, yeah. I hope I could do stuff that's detestable to God. Please say no. But when you're engaged in these things, what's God think about it? This is bad, man. This is detestable. And because of these detestable practices, the Lord your God will drive out the nations before you. You, though, God's people, of course, this context is Israel, but secondary application, you and I, you must be what? Blameless before the Lord your God. Right? So I have nothing to do with that. But then you could hear the naysayers say, well, that's just uh, the Old Testament. You know, that's just the Jewish people. We're in the New Testament, the New Covenant, grace, and we got grace to do whatever we want. Really? 2 Corinthians chapter 6. 2 Corinthians chapter 6. Is this something you want to be playing around with, being a part of, partaking in, trying to have both sides, you know, one foot in the world, one there? Ah, it's not the big deal, right? Let's take a look. 2 Corinthians chapter 6 and um, verse 14. Second, if you find uh, 1 Corinthians, what do you do? Hang around, that's right. Buying you some time there. 2 Corinthians chapter 6, verse 14. You get there, what do you got to do? Moo, all right, let's go. Do not be yoked with what? Unbelievers. Well, why? Well, now notice he didn't say don't witness to them. That's not the word that's used there, right? Uh, when you're yoked with somebody, basically, you know, how many guys are into farming? All, none of you, praise God. A little bit of Kansas comes out of me, right? Uh, you've got two oxen with a yoke, basically with a double yoke, right? Is you put the thing on both of them, and it's a harness that goes around their neck, right? And now they can both plow together, right? That's being yoked with them, right? And so you're working right alongside. You're working. That's what he's talking. You got, hey, we got a witness to unbelievers. Hello, the Great Commission is not the grand suggestion, right? But he's talking about you're right there alongside of them, just plowing right with them. Don't do that. Why? Uh, it doesn't work out very well. You can witness to them, right? But uh, don't be yoked with them. Don't be traveling. Don't be going down the same route as they're going because it's going to lead to destruction. He says, because what does righteousness and wickedness have in common? Right? Or, or what, what fellowship can light have with darkness? What harmony is there between Christ and Belial, which is an, a, a variant of basically saying the devil? Right? Uh, what does a believer have in common with an unbeliever? 
What agreement is there between the temple of God and idols? For we are the temple of the living God. And as God has said, I will live with them and walk among them, and I will be their God, and they will be my people. Therefore, come out from them and be what? Now, notice it's not separate like you got to live in a hill and uh, go hide out from society and just let them go straight to hell in a Ferrari, to use the phrase. No, we're to witness to them, right? We're to occupy, we're to be on the front lines. Don't go AWOL, but he's not talking about it. He's talking about being yoked with them. You're going in the same direction. You're living just like them, right? They're into darkness, you're into darkness, right? But somehow you think you can play both sides of the fence. No. He says, come out from them and be separate, says the Lord. Touch no unclean thing and I will receive you and I will be a father to you and you will be my sons and my daughters, says the Lord Almighty. Interesting. So let's take a look at this thing called Halloween. Where did it come from? What's really going on during this time? Lord willing, if we're still alive and still here tomorrow night. Okay, and is this anything that we need to be yoked with? Is this something that we think is actually pleasing to God? Oh, you're being legalistic. No, I'm just quoting Bible. Is this something that we should be partaking in. Uh, rather, what has been our mindset for many years is it is a time of great darkness. You shouldn't celebrate darkness, but at the same time, don't be yoked with it, but what? You should witness. I mean, for me personally, God brings a whole bunch of people to your door. Witness to them. You know, maybe after a while, the word will get out in the neighborhood they won't come knocking anymore. But do something for Christ. Shine Christ. If you're going to do something, shine Christ. But certainly don't be yoked with this stuff. Amen? So let's take a look at what goes on during Halloween. Hey, you guys ready to go back into the 90s? Hey, it's kind of dated, but it's still very good. Let's take a look. Hello, I'm Chuck Smith. And I'm Carol Matriciana. Welcome to this edition of The Pagan Invasion. Halloween is a festival that conjures up images of ghosts, skeletons, black cats, witches on broomsticks, and little costumed children scurrying about the neighborhood. Trick or treat! Oh my goodness! Who are you? Dracula's wife. While there are some people who may be concerned about the origins of Halloween and its focus on blood, death, horror, and the occult, to millions of youngsters across the nation, it has been adopted as a time to pursue scary fun. It is an opportunity to dress up in ghoulish or fanciful costumes, to engage in the fantasy of being a witch or a vampire, ghost or devil. Eager trick-or-treaters solicit candy door-to-door or bob for apples at Halloween parties. Others brave haunted houses and horror movie marathons, while the more daring visit cemeteries at midnight, play with Ouija boards, and hold seances in an effort to contact spirits of the dead. One of the biggest promoters of Halloween is the public school system. School-sponsored Halloween-themed activities often include dances, costume contests, carnivals, and arts and crafts projects. Education officials admit that more effort is usually put into the celebration of Halloween than any other holiday, including Christmas and Easter. Is the stimulation of a child's sense of fun and fear all there is to Halloween, or is there more? For many entrepreneurs, Halloween is big business a major promotional event used to bring in billions of dollars worth of revenue. In addition to the usual costumes of cartoon characters for children, a growing number of outlets are featuring more macabre and sinister creations for purchase. This one well-known department store chain will sell more than half a billion dollars worth of Halloween paraphernalia this year. And that doesn't include revenue from the sales of trick-or-treat candy. Costume shops such as this one are able to stay in business year-round as a result of the tremendous sales and rentals they receive during the Halloween rush. Farmers also view Halloween with an eye toward making big profits. Pumpkins are a traditional Halloween accessory used by households nationwide as jack-o'-lantern decorations. This one Southern California field of only 164 acres 
will yield nearly a quarter of a million dollars to its owner. Halloween is manipulated by the promoters of horror movies and videos as a major marketing opportunity. While horror films used to be synonymous with B-movies and considered the conventional low-budget industry standby, today they account for nearly 20% of all of the revenue received by feature film producers and distributors. The success of the technical revolution in special effects has attracted serious film directors to produce well-crafted, elaborate horror productions. A recent visit to the Video Software Dealers Association exhibition in Las Vegas showed that the two biggest selling artistic genres were pornography and horror. Hollywood is continuing to capitalize on society's growing craving for the occult and demonic. The irony is that while these producers label such films as fun and make-believe, many of them hire practicing witches or Satanists as technical advisors who ensure the authentic reproductions and performances of rituals, sacrifices, spells, and curses. People like are, are so hyper during the day, they need to come home and watch something that's like totally unreal so they can release themselves from all the pressures. It's just the type of thing that makes you laugh and forget about life. Over the last two decades, most horror films have become far more graphic in their depictions of violence and cruelty. Movies affectionately known as splatter films routinely detail torture and dismembering of bodies, drinking of blood, cannibalism, rape, and a host of other grotesque atrocities. Well, we think it's pretty fun. A lot of people just like it because it's fun, it's wacko, it's not real, and so it's just the type of thing that people like to watch because you don't have to think reality when you watch it. When it comes to gore or splatter or any other particular genres, the justification lies in our Constitution. I don't feel anybody has the right to tell me what I can or cannot watch. Most of these films receive R ratings, which mean that children under 17 cannot view the film or rent the video without the accompaniment of an adult. Yet this precaution is seldom enforced, for 15 is the average age of those who see these films. While many producers claim that these gruesome spectaculars are merely fun and not dangerous to the psyche of our youth, many of the scenarios from the horror films are duplicated in copycat crimes which make for sensational headlines. Glenn Hobbs was initiated into a satanic coven as a child by his grandfather and continued participating for many years. I recently asked Glenn about his involvement and the importance of Halloween to the occultist. Well, my involvement in uh, satanic worship was I was involved in it as a child. Of course, I was a generational satanist, what they call a generational satanist. And what that means is that my family was involved in it and their family before them. Now, my earliest rememberings of Halloween and some of the things that were involved was, it was a very dark time for me as a child. It was something that um, I didn't enjoy. Glenn, could you tell us about your involvement in any rituals at Halloween as a child? There was a, another little girl that was involved in the uh, the occult with me, and her name was Becky. Now Becky was another, a different type of child. She was uh, blessed to be a sacrifice. I was being blessed to be a high priest, where she was being blessed and born into the, the coven there to be a sacrifice. Now we were in a ritual where we were married together. Um, it was a marriage to the beast, and uh, me and the little girl were married together and there was a lot of sexual abuse that took place and a, a lot of blood that was spilt over us joining us together. When do Halloween rituals actually begin and what is the ultimate purpose of Halloween? Well the ritual that I remember the most clearly um, began about the end of September. Um, me and the little girl, the one I mentioned named Becky, the, the abuse was very concentrated at that time. 
Uh, we were taken into several rooms where our clothing was removed. We spent the next couple of weeks in a kind of a shack where a lot of rituals went on, where a lot of animals were, were killed. Um, they summoned Lucifer and his spirit to come and uh, possess me and so that I would be blessed to take over the position of the high priest at a certain point in time. Um, now, Halloween night, um, they had again put me and the little girl in the, in the back of this van and we again drove off, which seemed like for a long time. We were drugged once again. And we finally came to this stop. They took the little girl out and they left me in the van. Um, I could hear a lot of commotion that was going on outside. Uh, people that were, were screaming and, and yelling and, and uh, this low murmuring and a moaning noise that was going on, like some kind of a low chanting noise that was going on. So I knew in my mind there was some type of a ritual going on because I'd heard that many times before. You know, it was real common to see people fall on the ground and, and convulse and, and go into convulsions during the rituals and stuff with the demonic presence that were around. And uh, finally, a woman came to the back of the van and she said, it's time to go. And she brought me out of the van, and I could see that there was just a lot of people around. Uh, some were dressed in uh, dark brownish kind of robes with hoods over them. They took me up and they led me up to this stone altar. And uh, I remember I saw the little girl, and she was on the altar. Now, at first, you know, I, I just wondered what was going on because you never knew. I mean, they used the altar for a lot of different things. They could have just been sacrificing an animal over, could have been a sexual abuse from the high priest on to her. You know, it was a hard thing to, to know for sure. Well, they finally, they ushered me up to the altar and I could see that they had bound her feet. They had, they had her feet spread apart, her legs, and they had bound them to the ends of the altar and they had taken her arms, which were laying out this way, and roped them to the altar, which had little kind of like hooks, which they could bind the ropes around. And she was really white. Just, I, I, I remember seeing her and she was just real pale and real white. And I noticed that they had slit the bottoms of her feet and her wrists and they were taking the blood that was running out of those areas and putting them into chalices and passing those cups around to different people who were partaking of her blood. Then the, the high priest, he took the athami or the ritual knife and he picked it up and he put my hand on it and then he forced it into her chest. So when I think back on Halloween, you know, over that period of time that happened, you know, that was the climax event, Halloween night, where they, they killed that innocent little girl. And this is something that's happening every Halloween. That's not just an isolated event. I mean, there are children all over the world who are losing their lives during Halloween night, and yet we, as a society, we go out and celebrate it and we go door to door and we ask for candy and it's a it's a big celebration to us and I think it's quite ironic how one group of people are thinking it's fun and another group of people are taking human life and yet they don't you know there seems to be this wall and nobody wants to face the facts of what's really going on Today, reports from all over the world show a growing concern over the mushrooming attraction towards the occult. Heinous crimes connected with the occult, according to police, are reaching epidemic proportions. Halloween is the time when community service organizations warn that children and animals are most likely to be abducted. To truly understand the significance of Halloween and its role in this mayhem, we must go back to its historic roots. The south, the south, the west, the north, the west, the north, 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 the
What you are looking at are actual rituals and spells being performed by practicing witches and druids throughout America and Europe. These are not actors or reenactments, they are real. Most of Halloween's customs are the remainders of pagan superstition relating to Samhain, the Druidic New Year. The Druids were the influential priests, magicians and sorcerers of the nature religions that prevailed in early northern Europe. These native beliefs permeated Celtic culture for about 2,000 years up until the introduction of Christianity. Today, a revival of the practices of Druidism, along with various forms of witchcraft and nature worship, are sweeping across Europe and North America. The Druid orders are full of people from all walks of life, from uh, soap opera stars to um, doctors and lawyers, dentists and toilet cleaners. Um, anybody can be a Druid. I'm standing on Primrose Hill, which is one of the sacred sites in London. Um, and it was here that the Druid Order was inaugurated in its, its last uh, most recent cycle in 1717, when uh, a number of Druids from Wales and Scotland and Ireland and Brittany and England came together. And it is here that, that some of the ceremonies are held. Samhain was seen as a time when the dividing line between the dead and the living was at its thinnest. Consequently, contact with spirit beings was thought to be easiest. Samhain was also one of the major fire festivals of the Celts. At this time, the Druidic priesthood led the people in diabolical worship ceremonies in which they would sacrifice animals and humans in ritual killings. Human sacrifice has absolutely no place in the modern tradition. Just because we see a pagan revival doesn't mean that we wish to go back to barbarism of any sort. So it's a, it's a bit of a red herring. It's not something we like to talk about. The name for Druids is believed to come from the Greek word drus, meaning oak. Druids usually select groves of oaks for their ceremonies and use the leaves in their sacred rites. The work of the Druids consists in reuniting us with the world of nature externally and internally with that that stream of ancient wisdom and knowledge. Sharing the Druidic tradition of nature worship is witchcraft. The title witch is from the Saxon word wicca, meaning the one who practices sorcery. The Oxford Dictionary states that a wiccan is one who is twisted, bent or warped. Despite attempts from modern wiccans to sanitize the original intention of witchcraft, its practice cannot be divorced from demonology. O guardians of the watchtower of the east, I, Ishtar, High Priestess and Witch, do summon and stir thee. I command thy presence at this meeting to guard over our circle and to witness our rites. So mote it be. So mote it be. My mother was a witch, and my grandmother was a witch, and I have been a witch for as long as I can remember. Since I have been practicing the craft, there has been a great revival. I believe there's about a million people in England alone that practice witchcraft. The pagans are, are all over the, uh, the place with their covens. If they're not calling themselves witches alone, they are paganistic in their ways. There are probably now as many people practicing witchcraft in Britain as there are committed Christians. I regard myself as a natural witch. Um, I was uh, regarding myself as a witch since early childhood. Um, I was brought up in a very isolated part of the country uh, on the Welsh border which has a long tradition of magic and uh, Welsh sorcerers. It's almost as if there's a kind of grassroots feeling back towards paganism. We live in a kind of post-Christian era almost, and that people are moving towards a kind of neo-paganism, I suppose. We learn as practicing witches to tap into forces of nature and to actually, if you like, send out a spell or an incantation or an invocation um, in a very powerful way. 
it's in many ways to bring you back to nature, to bring oneself back to nature and to learn uh, how we fit in with the natural scheme of the universe and the natural scheme of the earth and understanding um, what we need to do to heal the planet. Because worship of nature is so central to their theology, large numbers of practicing druids and witches are dedicated to today's ecology movement. We have a number of initiatives uh, which include um, planting groves of sacred trees um, and a campaign for individual ecological responsibility which uh, is concerned with showing how each of us can become ecologically responsible. I think the time is coming now where we have to take the responsibility by the throat and actually get out there and say, there are answers here. And call I'm not prepared as a pagan, as a priest, and as a practicing also. witch to sit back and see my planet, my mother, raped any longer. Shepherd of goats, O oh answer unto me. Halloween is often confused as a Christian holiday because of its association with Christian All Saints Day or the Eve of St. Hallows All Souls Day. In fact, the original Christian dedication used to be celebrated in May and was intended to honor those Christians who died for their faith. But by the 9th century, the influential Roman Catholic Church changed the holiday to November and the Protestant Church soon followed. Today, a thin Christian veil attempts to disguise an ancient pagan festival of the dead, which has become not only a secular observance, but notorious as the most favored holy day of witches, sorcerers, and devil worshippers. I can't really say when I became interested in Wicca, because it's always been part of me, part of my roots. I love Halloween. I think I'm a very autumn person. We dress up the house with cobwebs and so on, and we cast a circle and we have a smoky cauldron and we all scry, which means cl do clairvoyance, into the smoke which comes out of the cauldron. And we open the gates of the underworld. And if any spirits want to come forward and speak, we listen to them. My first initiation, when I became first, first degree, was on Halloween. And uh, I felt very, very much in tune with the God. The ancient Druids worshipped Baal, one of the most powerful of all the demon kings. In the list of Enochian demons, Baal is said to be a king which is of the power of the East. Eastern religions emphasize that spiritual power comes from meditation. The common denominator between Druids, witches, and Satanists is the practice of meditation for the purpose of making contact with the spirits of the dead or disembodied souls. You do a lot of meditation with the, the arts and you get onto this higher plane, it becomes less physical and more mental. It takes years of painstaking study, um, meditational work, finding your higher mind, being able to actually tap into the forces of nature and use those. I have, uh, on occasion, touched upon, I suppose you could call them spirit guides. Um, people describe them in different way. I am aware of a hierarchy of spiritual advisors who live on another plane of consciousness that you can approach that will acknowledge you and advise you and assist you. We have what we, we call contacts. There's, there are other names for them. They are beings, that's the easy thing to call them, which can be, can be people who have lived on the earth or they can be God forms. They become almost as real as the people standing next to you. And whoever else you call doesn't actually materialize. You can't see them in, in the physical sense, but mentally you know that they are there. You can see them in your mind's eye. They represent really forces in the universe. Forces that are like gravity or or wind, but there are forces that have to do with our internal makeup and make our minds work in the way that they work. Margaret Adler, practicing witch and author of Drawing Down the Moon, warns that the trance state, with its roots in ancient shamanism and paganism, is not to be entered into lightly or when alone. For the spirit to be contacted actually enters the witch's body, using it to deliver a verbal message. 
there is a possibility if you don't cast a circle, um, the forces that could come into the room could take over uh, in, a, in a form of possession. Um, we had one, one example here um, where one young woman, a nurse, was um, possessed by, I don't know what it was, but a, a horrible voice came through her and she passed out. While occult procedures and their rituals may vary in intensity, the fact is that witches, as well as Satanists, commemorate Halloween night with the same fervent dedication to invoke spirits for personal power. Queen of heaven, queen of hell, hornet hunter of the night, lend your power unto our spell, and work our will by magic right. Glenn, you've now been a Christian for some time. What is your reaction when you see Halloween celebrated by people? Whenever Halloween time starts coming around, at the 1st of October, you go into the stores, you see the costumes, you see the, the mother with her little girl putting the witch's hat on her, and the little boy getting excited about getting the devil mask, and you see the candy, you see the Halloween pumpkins, you see people decorating their houses with skeletons and all these symbols of death. You know, it only serves to bring back horrifying memories to me. Memories of death, memories of children being so abused, so ripped of everything, their character, all in the name of Satan. If a person could really stop the next time they go into that store and realize that there are children who are going to lose their life because people are taking this a step further. There are people out there who don't just celebrate Halloween with trick-or-treat candy. This is a religious holiday to them. This is something that is holy and sacred, and they are taking innocent human life. I can't say, go ahead and have Halloween fun. It doesn't matter if you're participating in Halloween, even if you're not a Satanist, you know, if it's just for fun. No, because these Satanists are using this as a smokescreen. Glenn, you said that Halloween is a religion of Satan. What do you think when you see churches and Christians celebrating Halloween? It makes me sick that, I, that the church of Jesus Christ would take on this horrible demonic thing that is happening in our world. Christians should be the ones who are standing up against this. Christians should be the one who are saying these terrible things are happening and we want to stand against this. this. Churches should not be having these Halloween parties at all. They should be coming together as brothers and sisters in Christ, binding together and coming against these dark forces, praying for these children that God will spare their lives, that somehow God will intervene and save these children. Whether the public chooses to believe in the frightening growth of Satanism or not, the fact is that a highly organized network of Satanists are operating in America and Europe today. They seem to be respectable members of society and are integrated into all professions and walks of life. We go now to a special report from noted author Hal Lindsay, who is on location at a site known to be used for satanic rituals. We came out to a place in the hills east of Los Angeles to a location that has been identified in the past with ritual worship and we believe Satanism. Frequently this site has been uh, discovered with candles that had been used in ritual and you can look at some of the artifacts we found here today, upside down crosses that were put around, bones that uh, are scattered around here and uh, various satanic symbols but also something disturbing in the light of what we'll be talking about in the future, and that is the diaper of a very, very small baby. You know, I believe that this country is experiencing a pagan invasion, including a new upsurge of practice of witchcraft, the new age, 
and as we will talk about today, outright Satanism. Around the middle of the 1960s, there was a dramatic upsurge in Satanic worship, beginning with Anton LaVey and his writing of the uh, Satanic Bible and the founding of the Church of Satan in San Francisco in 1966. I watched as this accelerated, not just in the West Coast, but around the country. When Charles Manson and his gang in 1969 committed the horrible, brutal crime at Sharon Tate's home, this was done in connection with all of the paraphernalia of Satan worship. This started a whole avalanche of satanic crimes. We've seen serial murders. We have watched as one after another has been brought to light. Many murders where uh, satanic symbols have been discovered, the pentagram, 666, and all sorts of things of this nature were done. But more distressing, we have found all over the country reports that there are animals that have been mutilated in a very skillful and specific style that shows that they were ritually offered as sacrifices. There are now confirmed cases where there have been girls that have been used as breeders and their infant children have been sacrificed to Satan. Halloween seems to be the high holy day for the Satanist and the occultist. Halloween is the time when all across the country, in secret little places, in the dark, there will be little babies sacrificed to Satan. You don't believe it? I know it's hard to believe myself, but there has been such an acceleration of worship of Satan that we believe that these sorts of things are happening and we have evidence that they are. Satanism exists in this country as it exists elsewhere. It is appallingly evil. It is about murder. It is about child abuse. It's about sexual abuse. It is no joke and must be taken seriously and must be dealt with. If they can ritually abuse children, if they can in any way uh, sexually abuse children, uh, anything to destroy a child's innocence or their trust or their, their wonder at the world, they will do it. The most tragic stories that I've ever heard are where a child has told people what's been happening and the adults have said, don't be stupid, that doesn't happen in this country, you're, you're, make, you're making up stories, you're lying. The problem we're coming across is that the higher officials in these public uh, organizations do not want to acknowledge that this is occurring. We need to lift that veil of misunderstanding and saying, hey, this is a crime to be dealt with. It's the crime of the 90s. It's not going away. Satanists want to recruit. We know that it's been going on for many years. This is not new. But their arrogance and their outwardness about the way they recruit is becoming unbelievable. Sometimes they'll simply uh, suck them in through the local high schools, uh, sex and drug parties. We have an epidemic of young people participating in some strata of Satanism. Now, that doesn't mean that they're all out sacrificing human beings, but they may very well be doing the uh, rituals that involve mutilation of animals. One fire department individual told me all of the woods around our area have these types of rituals going on. It is believed that if you, if you kill an animal, that that exerts a tremendous amount of energy that the people there can sort of vampirize on, and so animals would be slain, uh, and this is especially true on the high holidays like Beltane and Samhain, Halloween and May Eve. There's something about sacrifice. If you do it once, you want to do it all the time. Once, you, once you've actually passed the barrier of sacrificing an animal, you get the sort of bloodlust where you, have, you really want to do it. And I, I really wanted to do it. This lady in a black robe came forward with this little baby. And at first I didn't realize it was a, a, a real baby. And she just laid it on the altar. It was breathing, but it wasn't crying. And then the high priest just took the athami, or the ceremonial dagger, and just cut the baby's throat and caught the blood in a chalice. At that point, I, I was 
staggering, reeling. I thought I was just going to, to throw up. I just couldn't believe it. But by then, I was so scared that I just stood there. And then when I was led forward, I thought, this is it, it's your turn, they're going to kill you. Um, and I was lifted up onto the altar. Now, I, I at that time was still in white. It was part of a, um, a sacrifice known as the Sacrifice of the White Virgin. Um, and the same blood that had come from the baby was daubed all over my body. Then the high priest raped me. And I think at that moment, I, I was just, the fact I was still alive went through my mind. I thought, you're still alive. I then had to sign in blood a parchment stating that I would never, ever reveal what had happened in a coffin. If I did, I would die. Are human beings being sacrificed? Yes, they are. There's a lot of things that I would look for to uh, make a determination on a ritualistic crime. It could be marks that are found at the scene, maybe things like a pentagram, it may be an upside down cross, could be again the number 666, could be a loss of blood in the body, uh, certain parts removed in a certain manner. They're victims, some were targeted for specific reasons, one because they wouldn't join, two because uh, they did join and they want to drop out. Some of their victims are themselves, they voluntarily do it. In many satanic groups, a mother will be asked to sacrifice her own child to Satan, and she may even, in fact, be ritually impregnated to do that. She may even specifically have, have been impregnated, and then when the child is born, they never register the child as being born, and they kill it in a very horrible way, and sometimes the mother herself is actually asked to do it. Some of you may not even believe what you've just seen. You may believe that this is just something that's aberrational and, and that... Uh, it just doesn't reach the mainstream of America. But just think about some of the headlines we've had recently. The case in Metamoros, where a group in Mexico were, were practicing human sacrifice, where they kidnapped and actually sacrificed several innocent young people. And think about the Night Stalker case here in Los Angeles, with Ramirez uh, brazenly flashing the satanic symbol and uh, saying, Hail Satan holding up his palm with a pentagram in it. And yet Ramirez was convicted of some of the most brutal crimes that we've ever seen in this civilized society. One case where he caused the woman to say, Hail Satan, while he was raping and sodomizing her alongside of her husband, whom he had already murdered. These are things that were done as a result, I believe, of getting involved in Satanism. The real Satanists, the hardcore Satanists, are involved in criminal activity, and for that reason they are going to try and look as normal as possible, the better to be able to deceive you. There are doctors, there are lawyers, there are teachers, there are oftentimes people who are in positions of great influence over small children. In a recent letter to syndicated advice columnists Ann Landers, a concerned parent wrote of a fourth grade teacher who had asked her students to write a short essay on what they would most like to do to celebrate Halloween. Eighty percent of her nine-year-olds expressed the wish to kill somebody. It is easy to see how Halloween's ambiance can promote an unhealthy desire for violence. All of today's seemingly innocent Halloween customs and symbols have their origins in the ancient Celtic Day of the Dead. For example, the practice of trick-or-treat is from Celtic tradition, where people gave food in return for blessings from spirits of the dead. Failure to supply treats would result in demonic retaliation. Jack-o'-lanterns grew out of the Celtic tradition of carving the faces of demonic spirits on turnips and later on pumpkins. The World Book Encyclopedia says the apparently harmless lighted pumpkin face of the jack-o'-lantern is actually an ancient symbol of a damned soul. Candlelit pumpkins or skulls at a home 
signified that the occupants were sympathetic to Satan and would therefore receive mercy by spirits and trick-or-treaters on their Halloween rounds. Perhaps the most sickening of all Druidic New Year practices were the human sacrifices which occurred at midnight. Adults and children alike would be thrown into huge fires while the celebrants danced around them in demonic fits of abandon. By morning's light, only ashes and bones would remain. These were called bone fires, which is where we get the tradition of bonfires today. The Druids believed that black cats were reincarnations of the evil dead and were possessed with supernatural power and knowledge. Bobbing for apples was part of the Druidic New Year sexual divination ceremony of fertility. The broomstick and witch's hats were originally considered phallic symbols. When used in the rituals of witchcraft, these objects supposedly transform the sexual energy released during orgasm into psychic energy. By understanding the pagan origins of Halloween, we can no longer claim ignorance. As parents, we are called to a sense of responsibility and must decide whether to allow our children to participate in occultic celebrations which glorify the powers of darkness. Deuteronomy chapter 18 spells out God's position concerning man's participation in divination, sorcery, or communicating with the dead. Verse 12 states that whoever does these things is detestable to the Lord. By participating in the customs of Halloween, whether in fun or ignorance, we are continuing in practices which have been consecrated to Satan. People who love the Lord should stand for separation from these things and not compromise. Christians can gather together at Halloween and use the night to educate themselves to the dangers of paganism and to take the opportunity to pray and wage spiritual warfare against the powers of darkness in their community. It can be combined with a time of worship, praise, and thanksgiving to our Heavenly Father for victory over Satan, death, and hell. Many of the people appearing on this program got involved in the occult because of a desire for divine-like power. The source of occult power is Satan. It is deceptive, exploitive, and will eventually fail to deliver on its promises. And there is always a hidden and heavy price to pay. The power God offers mankind, on the other hand, stems from a personal caring for that which he created. If you don't know God, but would like to experience his life-changing power, then recognize that Jesus Christ wants to be the Lord and Savior of your life. If you accept the fact that his death and resurrection is payment in full for all of your sins, you will have everlasting life. Within all of us, there is a God-shaped vacuum. Throughout the ages, man has attempted to fill that void with the things of the world. But it is only through a relationship with our Creator that we can be truly satisfied. His holy scriptures reveal the way in which we can be reconciled to God and that is through the provisions of His Son, Jesus Christ. Amen. So if you're going to be doing something on Halloween as a Christian, what should you be doing? Man, praying, that's for sure. And uh, witnessing, telling people that, uh, hey, there's hope. It certainly ain't going to come from Satan. Uh, it can only come from Jesus Christ. So that's what we should be spending our time on. So pretty blunt, as I warned you on Sunday, it's a little graphic, but hey, we've got to deal with it, folks. And uh, again, that was a little dated in the 90s, but guess what? It's still going on. And can I tell you something personally? I think it's way worse. Uh, and because if you take a look at, again, what's just being on television, what's being promoted in the media, and um, we have a whole generation that's now growing up thinking that uh, witchcraft is the way to go. Oh, and by the way, did you see how Satanism, witchcraft, and Druidism, all of them had one thing in common? about it was earth-based and that we need to save mother earth what does that sound like the environmental movement as we dealt before in our prophecy studies there is a spirit behind that movement and it is not from god okay it's old-fashioned witchcraft and that's another way to suck people in including through the school system and uh, but anyway it's straight out of the occult but hey we're gonna have a, a quick time of uh, prayer uh, re uh, and praise and uh, so let's get her going 
Well, hi, this is Billy Crone of Get a Life Ministries, and I hope you enjoyed today's study. But in closing, let me ask you one final question. Are you sure that if you were to die today that you go to heaven and not hell? Now, before you answer that, let me uh, share with you a couple things that the Bible says. The Bible says that God is holy and that we are not. And the wages of our sin or unholiness is death. We don't deserve to go to heaven when we die. We deserve to go down. We deserve to go to hell. Now, to make matters worse, we don't even want to admit this problem that we have, that we're separated from God not only now, but we're going to be separated from Him for all eternity in a place called hell. We, we, we don't even want to admit that. So, once again, out of love, God gives us what's called the Ten Commandments. The Ten Commandments were God's x-ray, if you will, divine x-ray to, to get us to admit the problem that we have inside that's separating us from Him. Let, let, let's take a look at a few of those of God's divine x-ray. For instance, if you think that you're worthy on your own, you don't need a Savior, uh, you're going to get to heaven all by yourself, then let's take a look at God's test there. Uh, the, the Ten Commandments. The ninth one says, you shall not bear false witness. That means lying. Uh, how many of you have ever told a lie before? Raise your hand. Okay. Uh, if you didn't raise your hand, you just told one. But folks, we've all done that. That makes us a liar. The Ten Commandments, God's x-ray, showing us that we have sin that's separating us from Him. We're not holy and perfect like Him. The Fifth Commandment says this, you shall not steal. Don't ever once take anything without permission. How many of you have ever done that? Well, if we're not going to tell another lie, we, we should all admit that as well. Well, that makes us a thief now. The Bible says that God is so holy, uh, even His name is holy. And that's why the Ten Commandments says, You shall not use the Lord's name in vain. And if we're honest again, folks, hey, a lot of us, how many of us have used the blessed name of Jesus Christ? The only name, the Bible says, under heaven, that men might be saved. We've now turned it into a common cuss word, if you can believe that. The Bible says that's the sin of blasphemy. The Bible also says, hey, show, you want to show God you're so perfect, you have no sin, then don't ever once commit adultery. And you might say, well, I, I've never done that, really? Jesus lays the standard before us. God looks at the heart. Man looks on the outside. Jesus said, if you ever looked with lust in your eye at another person, you've committed adultery in your heart. That's His holy standard. One more, the Bible says, okay, you think you're so good? Uh, then don't ever once commit murder. You shall not murder. And you might say, well, hey, I, at least I haven't done that one. Really? The Bible again says that the sin of hatred, wishing someone was uh, dead, is akin to the sin of murder. It's just, if you will, you pull the trigger in your heart. So, so, so how are you doing? That's just five out of ten of God's divine x-ray, by the way, uh, showing us the problem. How are you doing? Not if, but when your time comes, we're all going to stand before God. You will be forced to admit what He already knows. Hey, God, let me in. Let me in. I'm a, I'm a liar. I'm a, I'm a thief. I'm a, a, a blasphemer, an adulterer, and a murderer. And the Bible is clear. Such people as these will not inherit the kingdom of heaven. You're not headed to heaven in that state. You're headed to hell. But here's the good news. God said if we would just admit this, number one, then He could fix it. And it gets fixed only one way, and that's through Jesus Christ. Jesus said in the book of John, chapter 14, verse 6, He says, I am the way, the life, and the truth, and nobody comes to the Father but by me. Why? Because only Jesus lived the perfect life in our place. And Jesus died on the cross. He took the death penalty in our place so that we could be set free. And since we weren't there, and since it's a gift and we can't earn it, we have to receive that wonderful gift by faith. And the Bible says God will pardon us for our crimes, our sins, against Him. And you could actually see this analogy working uh, in the natural, in the normal world. Uh, we see this actually uh, in the courtroom. For instance, if a person is guilty and, and everybody knows they're guilty, they've committed a horrible crime and, and, and the, the sentence has passed, the judge has knocked down the gavel and says, hey, uh, you are going to jail, you are going to the death penalty for that crime. And, and we know that people, that happens all the time and they go to jail, but believe it or not, did you know there's a way for that person, even though they're guilty, to actually be set free from that crime? It's called a pardon. And the one in authority, the governor, has the part out of mercy, out of goodness, certainly nothing that that person did in jail. They can't undo the crime. It's too late. But out of mercy, the governor could go down there and grant that person in jail a full pardon for their crimes. And by receiving that pardon, the doors come open and they are set free and they're rescued from the death penalty. Folks, that's what God is doing every single day with us spiritually. He has allowed His Son, Jesus Christ, to take the death penalty in our place. 
He's pardoned us. But a pardon does you no good unless you reach out and receive it. And it's actually been on historical record that there have been people on death row who a governor has gone down out of mercy and extended to them a full pardon, but they've rejected it. And by their own doing, they went to the death penalty. Folks, don't make that same mistake for all eternity. God loves you. He's willing to forgive you of anything and everything you've ever done. All of it. Even the sins we don't even know about. He wants to pardon you and forgive you, but you must receive that by faith today. The Bible says if you believe in the Lord Jesus Christ, if you call upon His name, ask Him to forgive you of all your sins, believe in your heart that God raised Him from the grave, you will be saved. Please do that now. Please do that today, because tomorrow may be too late. Well, this has been Billy Crown of Get a Life Ministries. Again, thank you for joining us. If there's anything that you need, if you have any questions, please don't hesitate to contact us. Our information and number and uh, things will uh, pop up here on the screen here shortly. And remember, I hope to see you in heaven. God bless.